Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Ryan Holbrook. Um, I uh, actually teach up at uh, UCO in the uh, math department. Um, and I've been interested in uh, functional programming for uh, quite a long time, so I was um, excited to learn that there were uh, other people around here who were interested in it too. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today then is uh, category theory with a couple of applications uh, to Haskell and then also um, something that's been developed just recently, an application to uh, database programming. Um, how we can use the same kind of uh, techniques and abstractions that you used in the uh, Haskell type system to, uh, and apply it to uh, database relations as well. Um, so yeah, uh, just a quick outline. Um, two uh, of the uh, topics that we'll um, go into here, just categories themselves, uh, how it is that we can connect all of our uh, different kinds of data together using uh, functions or relations or um, other kinds of um, other ways of connecting them. Um, and then also these things that we call functors, which are just ways that we have of uh, transforming one kind of category into another kind of category. Uh, it's just a way of um, kind of moving from one conceptual system to a, another kind of conceptual system. Um, there are lots more kinds of things in, in category theory. Uh, it's a huge subject that's been around for a long time, um, but these are the, a couple of things that we'll, we'll look at today. Um, and then an example here uh, with database programming. Um, we'll go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, so uh, what is category theory? Um, so you could think about category theory as being the language of coherent composable systems. Uh, and so those, uh, those two words, coherent and composable, uh, are the uh, two themes for the, the talk today. Um, and those are the two big ideas in category theory. And so it tries to answer the question, well, if you have uh, a bunch of pieces of things that you want to assemble together into a larger part, how can you do that in a way that uh, isn't going to make your system break? Um, and so you want to compose things together and you want to do it in a way that uh, is, is coherent or consistent with some kind of system of rules. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it just tells us how to build systems and then uh, how to translate those systems uh, from one to another um, and using those functors as I, as I mentioned. Um, some examples of where this has been applied, uh, aside from just uh, Haskell and the uh, databases which we'll look at, um, you can see here in chemistry, uh, you have some things that you want to put together, chemicals that you put together to assemble into new kinds of chemicals, uh, quantum physics, so interactions between quantum particles, uh, electronics, wiring diagrams, that kind of thing. Uh, and so rule of thumb is that whenever you have a diagram that's showing how different things interact or how different things are assembled together, uh, you probably have a category uh, lurking around somewhere. Um, so uh, definition of a, a category itself, uh, pretty simple. Um, what you have are objects, uh, are dots um, in the red there, and then uh, arrows, which are the uh, things that hold these objects together. Um, and uh, you can see that this, of course, is just sort of like an abstract representation of any one of those diagrams that we had uh, seen in those examples. Um, and uh, some rules that go along with these, uh, how do we put uh, our things together? Well, arrows compose. Um, if we have two arrows, we can compose them together uh, to get a new arrow. And so the idea is just that, like if you start at one of the uh, dots in your diagram, you can follow the path to another dot, any other dot, um, in the category that you can get to through your arrows, and that's like a new arrow. Um, and let's see. Uh, so in addition to composing these things, um, we can do this uh, coherently. So uh, just like we have in, uh, with addition, you have a, uh, an associativity rule, so it doesn't matter if you do the first two first and then the last one, or uh, the last two and then stick the first one on the end, you end up with the same thing. Um, so in other words, if you're like, putting arrows together, you can drop your parentheses off, just like with addition. Uh, and then also we have an, uh, an identity arrow, so uh, you can follow a path, which is like doing something, or you can just stay where you are, which is like doing nothing. Um, you can think about that identity arrow as being like the number zero, um, and so it just does nothing, but it's still useful to, still useful to have. Um, and that's it, that's all there is to a category. And it turns out that just with these fairly simple rules, you can describe uh, uh, systems in, in very powerful ways. So, um, 
This uh, was just a, a, an illustration I, I tried to make of um, what the, the Haskell category might look like. Um, and so it's often called just a Hask, its category. Um, but the types here, or the objects of this category are the types, uh, functions or arrows. And so the way that we have of putting types together is just through the functions that we define. Um, and you can imagine uh, all of these types and these, these functions as kind of creating this giant web um, of different kinds of computations that you could do. Um, and then for each one of these types, you could even think about as being like a container maybe that holds all of the different values of that type. So the uh, integer type is just like a container that uh, holds, to get, uh, holds all of the integers, all the numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, and so every single type, a huge category, infinitely many types, infinitely many functions, um, just this giant web that sort of uh, goes on and on forever. Um, and so that's the Haskell category. Uh, I put there in a footnote almost. Um, so apparently there are some uh, kind of technical reasons why um, it might not completely form a category because of the undefined type. Um, it's sort of um, technical, but uh, morally it is a category. Um, you can treat it like a category most of the time and, and come out okay. Uh, yeah, so um, why do we like to do this? Uh, to, to prove that um, our Haskell system is a, a category. Um, it's because that we uh, get uh, all of those neat things like, um, or this power to prove things inside of our category. We can then develop like a type system. Uh, but then the, we can see here all of the things that we know we can do in Haskell. Um, functions compose. Uh, we have that composition operator um, and they do it associatively. Um, if you're composing functions together, you're always allowed to just like drop off the parentheses if you want to. Um, the order that you compose those in um, is, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then the identity operator we have as well. So uh, they compose, they do it coherently. And yeah, the point is just that we now get all these neat things to play with. Um, and we have this framework for doing different kinds of computations. Um, and we can do it uh, in this rigorous and coherent way. We can prove that our, um, our, our computations will come out how we want them to. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. <clears throat> um, so the uh, next example I wanted to look at here were um, databases. Uh, this is a kind of a, a new application that has been um, developed by some people uh, at MIT. Um, one of the guy's names was uh, David Spie Spivak and then uh, Brendan Fong. Um, but they had uh, developed this language that they're calling uh, CQL for uh, categorical query language. Um, and the idea is that uh, if you, once you recognize that a database schema forms a category, that you have these objects, which are just tables of data, and then the uh, arrows between them, which are your relations, like you have a, a foreign key in your table points to another table, and that just sets up this um, relationship between all the tables in your database. Uh, and so once you can prove that you have a category from your databases, you get all this cool stuff to play around with with your database programming, just like you do in Haskell. Um, you can define functors. Um, you can develop like a type checking system. Uh, you can prove that all of your data transformations, uh, all of your queries, uh, that kind of thing um, will always come out OK. Um, and so instead of you know, having to worry about something failing because it, uh, it was malformed, now we have a, a, a proof checker or like a type, uh, a type system inside of um, our, our databases now. Um, so uh, how do we uh, interpret this? Well, uh, each one of these, this was just a um, kind of a make-believe example. Uh, so maybe we have here uh, like a database that records um, like missions from NASA or something like that. Uh, so a uh, table, um, it just gives the name of the mission and then the uh, pilot that was flying on that mission. Um, the uh, table here translate to an object, so that just becomes one of your black dots. And then same thing for the uh, astronaut there. And then um, these attributes in the table, uh, name, um, those go to another object, which you can think about sort of like uh, what we had in Haskell. It's just like a type that contains all of the things of that kind. Um, and so that string dot is just like a giant infinite database table that contains all the strings that ever were. 
And so in this sense, your uh, keys in your, in your database table, when you point from one to another, um, are conceptually just exactly the same as the attributes in your table, like whether it's a string or something else. It's just an arrow from one object to another object. Uh, uh, also, to kind of make the relationship between this database category and the Haskell category a little more um, a little more specific, you could even think about if you had like memoized all of the functions inside of the Haskell category, it would just like record all of those function values in a giant table. And so if you had like an infinitely large computer and you could just memoize every kind of computation, what you would have then is not like a type category, you'd have a giant database. Um, and so it's the same kind of, uh, you'd have the same kind of relationships and the same kind of setup. Um, yeah, so uh, tables are objects, relations are arrows. Uh, let's see. And um, so then if we uh, have objects and relations, how do we, or uh, objects and arrows, how do we compose these things together? So uh, inside of our category, the composition operator is join. Um, and so if we wanted to have, uh, if we wanted to develop a query here, um, what's the name of every pilot that's flown on some kind of mission? Um, how you could develop that query inside of your category. So start off with uh, what it is that you're wanting to uh, select from. So start off in your mission object, and then just follow it. So pilot to get to the, the astronaut, and then pull out its attribute by um, following that name arrow down. And so this time, instead of thinking about joining tables together, you're just thinking about yourself as following paths along this category. Um, and so I think this is really nice because instead of having to um, think about how you're going to join all these tables together, you just follow some path in a diagram. Uh, much, much easier. Yeah? Sorry. Uh, is, SQL, is SQL intended to be used when you call into database? Uh, or can it be, is it a set of the translate into, say, being used for Postgres or something like that? <clears throat> yeah, um, the question was, uh, is CQL meant to be its own language or can it interface with uh, an external database? Uh, uh, yes, so um, this language it's a, um, comes together with an IDE uh, and they had uh, built it on top of Java. Um, and so they had uh, developed, or, or it has an interface to the JDBC. And so anything that JDBC can connect to, it can connect to, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's, I think it's really cool. Uh, this is just a snippet of that code, but we'll see some more of that um, a little bit later on. So yeah, those are the two um, examples we have. Okay, so now uh, that we know about uh, categories, let's take a look at how it is that we can um, translate between these things. Um, so especially with uh, data programming, one of your biggest um, problems is how do you transform one kind of data into another kind of data? Uh, or like in Haskell, um, what you talk about is um, maybe not quite as obvious in this sense, but it's like if you apply um, a, a functor to something or if you work inside of a monadic environment, it's like what you're doing is you're taking your ordinary type system and just like transforming it into this kind of parallel type system. And so it's, a, it's again a kind of data transformation. Um, so a, a functor here, what is it? It's a coherent mapping of categories. Um, we just map objects and errors in one category into objects and errors in another category. Uh, so how does that work? Um, well, here, uh, a couple of objects and an error between them. Um, the first thing that our functor is going to do is just pull those objects over. Uh, and so we apply a functor to an object, we get another object inside of some other category. And so this would just be like, um, if, so list is a functor um, inside of Haskell. And so like how do you take an integer type and apply the list functor to it? It just turns into a list of integers. So you're just like mapping those, uh, those types over. Um, and then so in addition, we also have those, that arrow data. And so we need to map those arrows over as well. And so um, our functor is also going to map that arrow over and just connect the, uh, those two objects. And then um, some rules for these things. 
not only do we map that data over, but we also have to make sure that we don't break any of those rules. So we have to have these uh, coherency conditions. Um, okay, so composition in the first category agrees with composition in the other category. That's what that first rule says. Um, in addition, the identity object is the same in both. Okay. Um, so this is, I think, a really um, great way of thinking about what a functor does or, or how a functor performs. So let's say that we are trying to map like this category C into this other category that we call D. Uh, so I like to think about this functor as creating an image of the first category into the second category. And so if you think about, well, how can we take our category C and then map it into this category D in a way that's consistent with all of its arrows. Well, we don't have that many choices. Like one choice we could make would be to like map C into that bottom loop down there. Um, another thing we could do, like maybe start up there and like map its image into that part of the category. Um, you know, other options. Uh, you know, so several things you could do. But the idea is that you could never map the category C into the category D but like reverse its arrows, like the arrows always have to go the same way. And so the coherency conditions in the original category have to match up with the coherency conditions in the category that you're mapping into. And so it's like you're kind of creating a, a little um, sort of identical image inside of this other category. Okay. Um, and so uh, here, functors in Haskell, uh, what makes something a functor in Haskell? So essentially a functor and Haskell is just anything that uh, implements this uh, function fmap. Um, so for lists, they just call it map. Uh, but what it does here is it takes an ordinary function, so like type A to type B, and then it just translates it into a function that works inside of the functor category. Right? So if you have like um, a function that goes from like integers to booleans or something, you apply this fmap to it, and it now goes from lists of integers or to lists of booleans. It just like translates the function along with the object. Yeah, so uh, another way to think about this is that um, functors are anything that you can map over. Um, anything that you can like take an ordinary function for and then like translate it into a new functor type function. Um, so that's functors in Haskell. And then uh, you might have seen before um, like uh, functors have to satisfy these two functor laws. Um, so just like we saw in the, the previous functor definitions, um, it has to uh, map the identity over and it has to agree with, with composition. Um, and uh, yeah, so sort of a picture of, of how you might think about a, a functor operating inside of the, the Haskell category. So like this maybe is just a little um, small piece of what that Haskell category is. And so if you apply a functor to it, you take the entire Haskell category and then just create or like map it into an identical image of itself. And you can do all of the stuff that you could do before, you know, apply your functions just like you did before. But instead of having simple values, you have these functor values. And so maybe that's lists, maybe it's the, uh, like the maybe type, the IO environment, any kind of monadic environment. It's exactly the same sort of environment that you're working in, same kind of computation, same kind of functions. You're just doing it into these functor values instead, um, moving around the same way. So uh, yeah, it contains its own image. And so something interesting to think about is, well, if the functor maps the entire category back into itself, well, that image also contains an I its own image which also contains its own image, which also contains its own image. Um, so you might have heard before of monads, which are kinds of functors, um, referred to as uh, fractals. Um, and so it's because you can think about monads or functors as fractals because they have this sort of self-similarity property. So the thing that you map into contains its own image, a complete copy of itself. Uh, and if you get a chance, um, I think it's, uh, do like a, an internet search for um, monads or fractals. Um, there's some really interesting uh, blog, blog posts to read about that. Um, by the way, uh, so what distinguishes monads from regular functors is that with a functor, if you apply a functor to the functor category, you would have like functor functor. 
but you know, like a list of lists or something like that. Um, but what distinguishes a monad is you can like <laughs> collapse multiple functors or monads onto each other. Um, that's the uh, join operation or bind, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so that's interesting to think about. Uh, let's see, so functors all the way down. Uh, yeah, so uh, a little example, um, functors in Haskell, list functor. So you have regular kind of function, um, the list constructor maps integers to lists of integers, booleans to lists of booleans, and then the f map uh, is what maps the actual function over. Uh, it just maps the integers, um, that entire function like that. Uh, so I think this is something that um, people have probably seen. Let's see. Okay. Um, so now, uh, database queries as functors. Um, so it turns out that you can think about uh, a query, querying a database as being a kind of functor. Um, and the reason is that you're setting up uh, some new kind of data structure that you're trying to match to the data structure that you already have in your database. And so it's a mapping of one kind of data structure to another kind of data structure, one system of relationships to another system of relationships. And the point is that you can't just return your data randomly, but you have to return it in such a way that it obeys the original setup of the database. Um, so it has to uh, obey these schema relations. Um, and so uh, how are we going to uh, define this? So what we would do first, um, this, uh, this uh, diagram on top, the, the, the capital A to capital B, uh, this is going to be the data structure that, uh, or the schema that holds the result of the query. Um, so you start to think about this in a way that's um, a, a little bit backwards maybe. Uh, but you start off with the, um, the result that you want, and then you think about yourself as like mapping it onto the entire schema, and just sort of matching it up um, object to object, arrow to arrow. And then once you have defined this mapping, you think about the actual data as existing in that bottom diagram, like little a to little b to little c. And then we want to pull that data back into the uh, the top diagram. And so you think about, you evaluate the query on whatever your database instance is, and it just pulls that data back up into that, um, up into that top category. And so think about this as being like two mappings that sort of go in opposite directions. First, you define the query. That's a functor that maps downwards, so small to big. And then you have eval, which is another uh, functor, which maps it in the opposite direction. So the first one is the mapping of the schema. The eval is a mapping of data. It just pulls it right back up. Okay. Um, and so this was uh, an example of um, how we could, kind of an extended example of some of this stuff. Um, so again, this might be like a database that just holds um, some information about a space agency, uh, some missions that they've gone on, um, what program it was a part of, uh, what rocket flew on the mission, um, the astronauts, and then some attributes for those things. Um, and then the data that might be in here uh, would be something like this. Um, so each one of them, uh, you know, some attributes and then some uh, keys that connect those things. Um, and uh, hopefully you can see here if you have like uh, say in that first row for the missions, Apollo 11, um, it's just telling you that its pilot is number one inside of the um, astronaut table, so Buzz Aldrin. Anyway, so um, this is the relationship between like the uh, schema, what looks like our category, um, and then how the data inside of the data, uh, inside of the database would look. And let's see. Uh, okay. So now let's say that we want to uh, query our database. How are we gonna do that? Um, so the query, query we want is uh, the names of all the rockets that have flown on a mission uh, with a pilot named Buzz and the objective of the missions program. Um, so fairly complicated query, uh, but we'll see that if we can just follow the information on our uh, schema up here, that it's really pretty easy to set up. So okay, let's break this down. 
um, names of all the rockets that have flown on a mission. And so, in other words, we're looking for uh, the mission's rocket's name. So start at the mission and then follow the arrow over to rocket and then follow the arrow down to, uh, along its name. And so that's like the first part of our uh, query schema. And then the second part, um, objective of the mission's program. So we're looking for the mission's program's objective. So start at mission, follow the program arrow over, and then follow the uh, objective arrow down to its attribute. Okay, so how does this define then that, uh, that query schema? So what we're doing is we're taking um, this queue, mapping it onto the mission object, and then you can think about each one of those arrows going to string as just being mapped to the two paths along either side. And so the original mapping is just taking that um, one on the right and then mapping it down to uh, the schema on the left. So this is how we're defining um, that original query. And then again, uh, so this is what the code looks like. Um, how do we get our uh, data out of the database? We then just evaluate that query um, on whatever instance we have. So thinking back to that uh, database table, like we can evaluate our query up here on our uh, instance, and that gives us, um, pulls out our data. Uh, also, let me mention um, this where clause. Uh, this is something that you can do um, inside of this uh, CQL language, is that any kind of Java function um, can operate inside of a where clause. Um, you just insert Java functions um, into the database type, and then you can use any kind of function like that to filter your data. Uh, and so when we pulled that data back through the instance, it just got filtered um, by that where clause. So uh, here, even what I think is a maybe a fairly complicated query turned out to be pretty easy. Um, let's see. So uh, that was um, what I wanted to look at. So category theory, um, it's the uh, language of coherency and composition. So just like you have all different kinds of languages, um, so like logic is true and false, geometry, shape and size. Uh, category theory, whenever you have things that you're trying to compose together to make sure that, uh, and to make sure that your system doesn't break, there's coherency, um, you're probably talking about a category somewhere. Um, so, thank you. Uh, questions? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the question was, if you use a Java function inside of your query, do you have to be cognizant of the performance implications? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I imagine so. Um, the software as it stands right now, I think is still kind of in an alpha stage. Um, it, it, so uh, some of the things, so the state it's in now is that doing hard things is easy and doing easy things is hard. Um, so like even sorting data is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, but uh, like setting up queries and doing like complicated sorts of data transformations is, is relatively easy. But yeah, I imagine that would be the sort of thing that um, you know, what could probably be worked on. Yeah. All right, well, thank you.